so this will be a, a lecture advanced network, so don't be afraid by the, by the title, try to make it simple. So but the goal the goal is to focus on uh, network core network architecture. And so we will see uh, different things. One will be related to uh, uh, to routing protocols, and the other one to bridge. During this week, if I understood why it's your vacation week, okay. So during your vacation, we will see some uh, something about networking. So the first one will be about uh, spanning trees. So we will stay at layer two. And we see, uh, maybe you have already seen the spanning tree, but we will look at it in more details and we will see how we can create, at layer two, bigger network, not just a, a company network, but what we call metropolitan networks, meaning that you have a layer two network that covers a city, for example, to collect traffic. So this will be very important because at the end of the class, when we will see VPN and all these things, we will have, we will see again this, uh, this concept and how we can interconnect layer 3 routing with layer 2 bridging. So that's why I will uh, have this introduction. So this, in the second part of the class, we will have something more on IP. And so we are going to look at briefly what is IP because I, I have seen what Nicola gave you uh, last week. And you have already seen TCP IP protocol. So here we will not focus that much on the packet format or in the protocol by itself, but I will give more. Uh, we will look more in more detail to the address. So how we how we manage addresses in network, because at our level the most important thing is the addressing part. So we will see how it works, and you may know that now we have a big problem with internet because we have no more addresses to give to equipment, so this is with the current version IPv4, and so we want to introduce a new version of the protocol called IPv6. So during this first part, we will see why we have this problem with IPv4, what are the tricks we imagine to make IPv4 live longer than expected, and we will see how we can introduce uh, IPv6 in, uh, in the network. And then, after that, we will have a very big part of the class that will be on routing protocol. So we will go and we will study deeply, deeply some routing protocols. So uh, we will look at some protocol like RIP, which are distant vector protocols that are no more used in uh, current architecture. But these concepts are very important because when we look at new things like uh, M2M, machine to machine communication, or if we look at sensor, wireless sensor network, we have some things that look like RIP and are based on uh, a distant vector. So that's important to continue to see that kind of architecture. Then we will see uh, OSPF in detail. So OSPF is a protocol you use in uh, large companies to run uh, a network. And we will see also something that is very similar to, IS, to OSPF which is called IS to IS, and which is used mostly by providers. So we see this protocol, and then something that doesn't appear here, but we will see MPLS, so how we can uh, interact between the routing protocol that we have seen here and MPLS, and how we can create a large, large, large network using MPLS. And finally, if we have time, and I hope we will have time, we will see BGP and the interconnection between BGP protocol. So BGP is a protocol that is used by provider to exchange information between uh, uh, themselves. And we will see how we can interact with MPLS and how we can create VPN. And with VPN, we will see that we can have layer 3 VPN, means that we are running with them at layer 3 or layer 2 VPN, and this way we can make a link with what we have seen, uh, we are going to see right now. Okay? So, this is uh, almost what we, we are going to see during uh, this week. 
if we have to, if you have questions, if you want to see some points in more detail, or if you have already seen some parts, so tell it in now and I can adapt the lecture. So that's fine. We are going to work at layer two. So first, can you tell me what when I say layer two? What do you have in mind? Big layer, yes. So what what are the characteristics of big layer? Yes. Yes, sorry. The type of vision. Yes, the type, yes. The dimension. So, in type layer 2, do you know some layer 2 protocols? PFP. Really? ARP? ARP, no, not really. ARP is a protocol that is used to make the link between layer 3 addresses and layer, layer 2 addresses, MAC addresses. That's not, it's a protocol, it's not a technology. So when I talk about layer 2, I am thinking about technologies. So, I will go back to that around you. Wi Fi, it's a layer 2 technology. We have Ethernet, it's also a layer 2 technology. Point to point link can be viewed also as a layer two technology. So, what is the main characteristic of layer two technology is that they are not scalable. And scale scalable is a very important uh, concept in network. Do you, can you give a definition of, what, of scalable? Yeah. But when you have something scalable, it means that when you have few users, it works well. Um, when you increase the number of users, then you have preferences that goes down. So, for example, a broadcast is a non-scalable technique because when you send information or People are sending information, and everybody receives this information. So the more people you have, the more traffic you have, the more traffic you receive, and so you have to process more and more traffic. And of course you have less, maybe you may have less time to send your traffic. So for example, when you take a hub, a hub is used to create a broadcast. If you connect eight users, then you will have no problem. But if you want to connect one uh, one thousand user, uh, then you will have some problem because you will have. A, if you look at Ethernet, you will have a lot of collision. But even if you have uh, no collision, you have to share your traffic with your host. So it means that you have less and less bandwidth. And if you put collision, you know that with collision you have to to compete with your host. So the more you have people, the more you have to compete. Um, the less powerful will be the, the protocol or the performances of the network. So that's something very important is that when you design a layer two network, this layer two network is not scalable. So that's the main characteristic of layer two compared to layer three where we have scalability. So why? People prefer to use scalable, non-scalable network. Why do we have, at layer two, some technologies that are not scalable? Yeah. So the counterpart of non no scalability is that they are easy to manage. And of course, when you have something scalable, then you have to manage it. 
unmanaged. It means that you have a cost. So, one thing we like to do, and if we want, so layer 2 is very attractive because layer 2 is easy to manage. You cannot put a lot of users, but you can have something that uh, runs very easily. You just put equipment and it works. You have to configure it then a little bit, but it's all, it works quite easily. And normally, it's, you will have no trouble at layer 2. So, for example, when you are configuring an IP network, and it doesn't work. So maybe it's layer one, so the physical because link, because we are, you have trouble with your optical fiber, which is broken. Or it's layer three, because you make you didn't configure it well. But normally you can rely on layer two. So it means that you don't have too much problem at layer two. So but the problem is that it's not scalable. So what we plan to do, and what we are going to see in this part is how to increase the scalability of layer 2 network. So if we can increase the scalability of layer 2 network, then we can have wider network, easy to manage, so the cost of this network are very low, and we can handle, for example, a lot of, lot of users on that network. So it's what we are going to, to see, and we are going to start just with uh, simple networks, like local area networks. And here, you see, so, it represents three Ethernet links. So I represent Ethernet like a uh, cable, that's a whole representation, but it doesn't matter. And so here we have two hosts, A and B. Okay? So we are in a kind of plug and play at this level, it means that A and B have MAC addresses, and MAC addresses are given by the manufacturer, the device manufacturer. Okay? So, there is no logic. Of course, there is a logic in the address. Remember, you have the first three first bytes is the name of the manufacturer, and the last three bytes are the serial number of the product from these manufacturers. So, there is a logic on how to build the address, but when you create your network, there is absolutely no logic on addressing. So you can view addresses as random numbers. You know that they are unique, but that's all. So, when A wants to send a message to B, we have some bridges here, so what will happen? So A sent its friend on the link. This is a broadcast link. So it means that every equipment, every device here, receives the information. Normally, the, the device that doesn't recognize their address, so that doesn't recognize the address, say that's not for me, and they discard the information. Okay? Here the bridge is working in a mode we call promiscuous mode. It means that the bridge is listening to all the friends that are running on the network. So the bridge copies a friend in its memory, finds that A is located on that interface, and then doesn't know where is B. So the bridge sends it on all its interfaces. So the bridge sends it on that one. So here the frame is sent, and this B2, B2 bridge does the same as B1, takes the frame, look at the source address, so they say that A is reachable from this interface, and doesn't know where is B, so, so send it on that link. And here you will have a host that recognizes this address, and so, take the frame. Okay, so it works well. And now, if I do that, so I put another bridge. So, does it work? Yes. 
as so. Okay. Uh, does it mean that B receive will receive twice the trend? Hmm? Could be. Could be, yes. But if it receives twice, that's a problem, but that's not a big problem. So here we have a bigger problem. It means that here, A sends B, so we have this way, and of course B3 will take the frame and send it here, on the other So we will have to copy. But this copy will be taken by B2, and B2 will send it to B1, and B1 will send it to B3. And the opposite, the frame sent by B2 will be copied by B3, and will take back by B1, take again by B1, etc. etc. So it means that here, we will have, we send only one frame on the network, and after a few seconds, we will have a memory. We don't have any more network, we have a memory that gives all the frames you have sent on the other network. And here we see that we have twice the frames. But on this frame, we'll keep the B bridging from one bridge to another. And if I put another equipment here, it's worse because I will send one frame and I will have multiple copies of the frame. If each time I go from, so I send a frame, so I will have two copies from B1 and B4 to B2, one that will go to B3, and then I will have four copies of the frame, etc. etc. So it means that here, it doesn't work anymore. Okay? Here I have a problem because I put devices on my network and I break my network. So it's something that is again the easy to manage paradigm. Because here at day or two I buy equipment, I plug it on the, on the network, and it must work. It must work. And here it doesn't work. So that's why we have to find some ways to avoid this kind of thing. So do you have an idea of how we can solve this problem? Yes? It's not what we are going to, to do because here you see that why do we have a copy? It's because our why didn't add come back. Kind of come back, but why uh, it, it worked before? It's because before I had only one way to go from one point to another. It's what we call a tree. A tree. We have only one path to go from one point to another. And here I have a graph. Okay. And what what definition of a graph we can give is that we have different paths to go from one point to another. To go from A to B, I have one path that goes from B3 to B, another path that goes from B1, B2 to B, another one from B4, B2, and B. So it means that I have, if I can disable some interfaces, then I will have again only one possibility to go from A to B, and this way I will have no more routes. And so that's why. We, we have to implement a new protocol on the bridges. Until now, our bridges were completely silent. It means that they just copy the information that arrive on an interface, analyze the source of the destination address, and find if they have to send to copy the frame on other interfaces. But the bridge was transparent because the bridge didn't change anything here, the bridge will continue to be transparent, but we will add another protocol that will able to disable some interface. So, we are going to see this algorithm. So, this algorithm is called spanning tree. What does it mean, a spanning tree? It's a tree that goes everywhere a graph goes. But, so it's spanning, but it's a tree because you want to have only one path to go from one point to another. So to understand the, this algorithm, 
The best way is to look first at some numbers, and after that we will study, we will have vectors that are more complex to manage. But the idea is to look here on this graph. You see we have a graph here because we have, for example, to go to from an interface from 5 to 8, we have one path here, a direct path, and we have one path that goes from 3 uh, to 3 and then to 8. But if I cut only one interface, so here I cut, for example, the interface at 5, that comes from 3, so this way I have only one way to go from one point to another. So now, how we can cut this interface? So here we are going to suppose that all these uh, elements here have a unique number. So if you have a unique number, you can have an order relation between these numbers. It is less or higher, but it's never equal. Okay? So we are going to look first at the smallest value. So we have 3, 5, and 8. So the smallest value is 3. So everybody will agree. So we are going to exchange information and say my value is 5. I am have, I have the smallest. If I receive something from 8, I say OK. I continue to be the smallest. But if I receive something from 3, I will say I am no more the smallest, and the smallest is 3. OK? So, we find that 3 is the smallest and 3 will become the root of our spinning tree. So here is what we are going to see. So now I have the link that goes from every node to my root and this link will remain active. So here we will continue to listen to traffic on that link and we continue to bridge traffic to them. But here you see, one link is remaining. This link is not a path to the root. So we have to find if we continue to use it or not. So here, what we are going to do is we have a value. My value is 5. And I say, I am the smallest value on that link. If I am the smallest value on that link, I will, dump, I will not block that link. If I am not the smallest element on that link, I will block that link. So here, 5, receive a message from the green element that says, my value is 8. So here I am happy, because 8 is higher than 5, so I continue. I am still the smallest element, so I will continue to have that. Now, the green one receives a value 5, this value is smaller than 8, so it's not good, so I will block this. But then that here, this 8, 8 here on the path to, to 5 will block traffic. It means that it will never listen to traffic that goes on that link and never, will never forward or reach traffic to that link. And if I disable this interface, you see that now to go from 5 to 8, I have only one path that goes through 3. Okay? So that's the main idea of the spanning tree. Now we are doing, but here you see it's a very, very simple case. And when we are running that on the uh, local area network, it's more complex because here we don't have only point to point things, but we have a shared link. It means that we have different elements that can be reached from one interface. So we are going to, to see how it works. So first, Instead of having one value, as in the previous example, we are going to have a vector of values. So this vector will contain four values. 
And this value will be first the root ID, so the value of the root, then the cost to the root, then the bridge ID, it means the ID of the bridge that sends information, and then the port number, it means the interface on which the bridge, the bridge will send the information. And we will say that the value is higher than another if, or is smaller than another, if the first, uh, first number, so here the root ID, is smaller than the other one. And here you know that, as we have done in the previous example, the goal is that everybody on our network will agree to have the smallest element, the smallest bridge, as the root. So that's the first, uh, first value. So if we agree on the root, so here we will have v1 equal to u2, to u1. Right? So in that case, if we have the same value here, then we will go look at the second value. The second value is a cost. So our whole goal is to have the smallest tree. Because if we, each time, if we have a very long tree, a very deep tree, then we have to copy a lot of time information from one bridge to another. So when, when we agree on the value of the root, then we have to minimize the number of bridges we have to cross to reach the root. So that's why we have the cost here. And if we don't agree on the cost, it means that we agree on the identity value of the root, we agree on the cost to go to the root, then we will select the identity of the bridge. So this is more arbitrary here. And if it doesn't work, then we will look at the port number. Okay? So, let's see that on an example. So here, we come back to the example we got before. Three links and four bridges. I will give here an identity to all these bridges. So 20, 18 for the B3, the red one, 13 for the blue one, 22 for the brown, and uh, 25 for the orange bridge. So we suppose that now, at this moment, we switch on all the bridges. Okay? So at this moment, when all these bridges become active, they believe to be the root. So they send on the links some messages that say, I am the root, the cost, for example, 18 say, 18 is the root, the cost is zero because I am the root, my name is 18, and I send it on port 1 here, or on port 2. And all this equipment will do the so, and of course they are listening to the traffic. And B3 will not be very happy because he will receive a message that is smaller than uh, what he sent. He said 18 here, and he receives, he receives something with 13. So, 13 is better. So he said 13 is the root. He will receive something for 22. And he said, I don't care, I'm smaller than 22. But 13 is the root. So, 13, so the blue bridge, will never receive something better than the message he sent. So nothing is less than 13. So he said, I'm the root. And all the others will say, we are not the root. So as we have seen before, the link, the path to the root, will remain active. So here, this interface that goes to the root is active. This interface here is the root, so all this interface is active. Before, the interface that goes to the root is active, and V2, the interface that goes to the root is active. Okay? And, now, what do we do? We announce the good news everywhere. So, for example, 18 say, now, the root is 13, 
The path to go to the root is 1, because I'm copying this message. I am 18, and I will send it on that one. And now we look at some interface where we have some trouble. So here, for example, this interface of V4, interface 2, has received something that say 13, uh, 0, 13, 1. And he received here something that is 13, 0, 13, 2. So we say, this interface is not good, I will block it. Okay, because this value here is smaller than the one yes. Same thing here. Here it receives something that is smaller than what it said. So we will block these two interfaces. This one will never has never received something smaller than what is sending. So this interface will remain active. So at the end, we have this network. So you see that we have disabled two ports. The port 2 of B4 and the port 2 of B2. And here we have no loops. Okay? So that's uh, the algorithm of the spanning. I will not go in uh, too much detail about that, but in fact, you see that if you look at the algorithm as it has been implemented uh, many years ago, here you have the state machine of the bridging part. It means that at the beginning, maybe you don't activate the bridging functionality on your equipment. So you are in a disabled state. When you enable bridging, you are going in this big grid state here. So what do we do here? First, your bridging is blocked. So it means that you activate administratively bridging on your equipment, but you will not grid thread. First, you listen to spanning tree traffic. And for a few seconds, you listen to that traffic, and if it's okay, then you go to listen. In the listening part, what do you do? is to listen again to spread into traffic to see if you can, your interface continues to be active or not. If you receive any message that is lesser than what you are sending, then you will block your interface and go back to the blocking state. If after 20 seconds it's okay, then you receive nothing smaller than what you are sending, then you go into the learning state. In the learning state, you don't bridge, but you listen, you listen to the traffic. And this way, you can construct a table that locate equipment underneath. So you will know that this MAC address, this MAC address, and this MAC address can be reached through this interface. This MAC address, this MAC address that can be reached through on a random. And after 20 seconds, then you become again active. It means that here you forward the traffic. Of course, at any moment, if you receive a spanning tree announcement that is lesser than what you are sending, then you go back to the blocking state. And in the blocking state, then you can come back to listening experience. But you see that this pack is quite long. It takes up to 40 seconds to discover, for example, that the element that was sending you something smaller than you has disappeared from the network, and you may start again to do this. So it takes about one minute to bridge the traffic. So if I come back to the example here, you see that what I want to reach an equipment or a, a device on the, the lowest network, and I'm in the upper network, so normally I go through B3. But here, 
If B3 fails, then I will know and never I will not receive again smaller announcement from this equipment. So it means that after one minute I can activate this interface. Okay? The problem is that when I have voice when I am sending STP file, uh, file transfer between to the computer and these two networks. If I'm losing the connectivity for one minute, <coughs> it's not a problem. I will wait one minute more before starting again the, or continuing the file transfer. If I am doing voice over IP, and I know that you are now voice over IP experts, so you, you will have trouble because you will lose the connectivity for one minute. And it will not work for voice. So it means that we have to speed up this recovery phase. So that's what is doing spanning tree. So how it does work? First, here, if I come back to this example, how we discover that an equipment is down. It's because every 40 seconds, this the root will issue a message and this message will be copied by over bridge. So if we lose connectivity somewhere, for example this equipment is done, so after 40 seconds we know that we don't receive the message, so we say this interface is done. But it's based on the upbeat of the root. Of the so in rapid spanning tree, we change the view and every we it's when so every node bridge is sending every 10 seconds a message. Even if we are losing these messages, then we will declare the interface down. So we don't wait that the root sends this message. So it takes less time to discover that uh, a link is done on this way you can ask something that uh, works better. And we also adapt this to switch to switch technology, but I will not go into it. So this way, if you have a loss of connectivity, then you can recover the network in about five or six seconds. So that's something better. So now I have some questions for you for you. So here you are working in a company which are four buildings, okay? And here, you want to put a one, gigabit, one gigabyte Ethernet links between all these buildings to have a good connectivity. And what you do also is to put a full mesh network, to create a full mesh network, it means that you have different paths to go from one point to another. Okay, so what will happen on that network? Of course, we are using switches, and switches are running spanning. So, which will be the root? 22 is the smallest. So, every Bridge here will send its identity, and here we are, everybody will agree on the smallest value. So 22 will be the root. Which port? Uh, root port. So that's also obvious. Is all the links that goes to the to the root. Okay, so we, so we need to have. It's not a link of the block, an interface. So here, we look here, by the form between A and B. So A will send to B, my ID is 34, and B will send, my ID is 80, uh, 87. So when A receives a message from B, A remains the smallest one. So A will continue 
to send traffic here, then be able to send traffic. But B, receive an ID which is smaller than it, its ID. So in that case, it will block this interface. Same thing for B and uh, we go C or D here. But here, what do we have? 4664, 87. So we will block also this port too. And between A and or oh, 34 and 64, same thing we block. So it means that here, you see that these links that make the triangle are not used. Okay? They are not used because here you block one of the interfaces. So it means that this one will never learn MAC address going on that link because the other one doesn't send, send traffic. And it will only send traffic here when it doesn't know the address. Because when A receives something with an unknown MAC address, then it, will, it has to send it on all the interfaces. But these two ones, so the one to 80, uh, 87 and the one to 64, are not used, and these two equipment will never listen to the traffic. So it means that you will just broadcast some frame here, but you will never really use it for production. It means that here, what happens in this example, it means that all the traffic, if you want to send traffic from A to B, then the traffic will go through the route. So all the one giga link you put here, are not used. In fact, you put three links that are never used, when there is no failure, and only three links, the one that goes to the root, are used on the network. So it means that you will have more traffic on this equipment, the delay will be a little bit longer because it doesn't send directly, but you go to that. And the other problem, Suppose that when I do that computation, I didn't take into account the speed of the link. I just use the MAC address. Or I use here 22. The 22 can be used as a MAC address. So I use this, and of course, I may have here very slow links. And when I'm selecting my route, I do it by its identity. So suppose that here I create a very high speed network between A, B, and 64. And here is a backup network with uh, smaller links. It means that I will put my normal network, my production network, as backup network on my backup network as a production network. And I will have bad performance. So you will have to change, to be careful of that, and change the root value, the, the, the root identity to put a higher number, for example 99. And this way, this device will never be used as a root on your network. Or will be used as, as a root if over a device Fails. So it can be used on that. So you see that here it's not very easy to, to solve this problem. Because you have to play with some identity here, and there is no relation with your, your traffic or the capacity of your. So that's a big problem for that kind of thing. So that's why, but I will not go into details during that class, but I, you can have a look if you are interested by that. It has the uh, IEEE and the uh, IETF are working on other ways to do bridging inside the network. Instead of having here a spanning tree protocol, what they plan to do is to use 
good thing for the world. So we are we are not seen right now a good thing for the world. But with Routing Protocol, what we can do is to create, to learn about bridges on the link and make some tunnel, kind of tunnel, to that uh, uh, between all these bridges. And for example, here, what I will be able to do is when A wants to send to B, to send directly the traffic from A to B and not go through the route. So this way we can avoid the use of route and we will have a better mapping of the traffic. So that's the first thing that is uh, useful. The second thing is that we can detect more efficiently when we have a link fa failure and we can recover the network more easily than what we can do with spanning. So at ITF we have a group that is called TRIL, Transparent Interconnection of Lot of Links. So it's a working group that opens that. And at IEEE, you have another group that is working about the same uh, solution. So, here we have still a very, very low scalability in our network. So what we are going to, to do now, right now, is to try to increase the scalability of the network by splitting our physical network into different parts. So it's what we call VLAN. I don't know if you have already seen uh, that. Yes? Okay, so we can go very, very quickly. So the, the VLAN, what we want to do is to take some advantages we have at layer 3. Because at layer 3, for example, you can have filtering and you can isolate traffic from one kind of user to another kind of user. If we are at layer 2, all the traffic are merged. So that's a problem. So layer 3 is better to isolate traffic. But layer 2 is better because you don't have to configure things. So we would like to do a, to have the advantage of both worlds. So here we have a switch. So what we will do in that switch is, so here I have a normal switch, when I send the unicast frame, what will happen? The frame will live through only one interface. Okay, because the bridge, the switch has learned where is located the destination and will send it to that destination, only to that destination. Now when I send multicast or broadcast, what will happen? Okay, so it's normally yes. For multicast, it may only go to some port. But if it's only if our bridge is very clever, if our bridge is a little bit stupid, it will process multicast and broadcast the same way, and will copy the information on all the ports. So that's a problem because, for example, you are sending a movie in multicast on your company network, and so the switch will send information everywhere. It's also so that's a problem. So you have you have different way to, to solve that problem. One one possibility is to use a layer two protocol called GAP. Generic attribute registration protocol. And it means that when an interface register a multicast address or send a multicast, use a multicast address, then it sends a register message to the bridge. And the bridge will know that this port is interested by this multicast group. And so when you receive a frame for that multicast group, you will only send it to port where the bridge receives a register message. The problem is that this is not very popular 
and you don't have a lot of cards, Ethernet cards, that send GAP messages when they register to multicast mode. So we have a layer screen violation, or layer violation, is what we call IGMP snooping. What does it mean, IGMP snooping? Is that your bridge, so normally when you are doing multicast at layer 3, you have a multicast router and you send an IGMP message to that router to say, I want to receive traffic for that multicast router. And here, the switch will listen to that layer 3 message. And the switch will notice that you are interested by this multicast node and will send it only to you. Does that mean here that the bridge is clever or is cheating, depending if you are depending or not the OSI model, because here it uses layer 3 message. So it works well when you are working with IPv4 and you are using multicast at IPv4 level. But if you are using, for example, IPv6, IPv6 will not use the same messages to uh, register to multicast mode. That means that your switch, if you buy a switch that don't do IPv6, then your switch will not process efficiently uh, IPv6 multicast and will send it to all the ports. So that's the problem with uh, layer of violation in the US side model. But the advantage is that you don't have to do anything at layer 2, it's done directly at the multicast is only managed at layer 3. So, but that's when you want to reduce the load. So suppose that here, multicast and broadcast are in process uh, the same. So, now, we are going to, to make a VLAN. So it's not very readable on that uh, example, maybe you have to shut, shut the door to see the color difference. I don't know if you can see it here. But you have some port in green and some port in red. So this is a bit better to see the difference between green and red. So it means that here I have configured manually my switch. So it's something new. Until now, I told you that switches, you put it on it works. But here I have to configure it to say this port is green and this port is red. It means that this port belongs to a VLAN and this port belongs to another VLAN. So it's like splitting the switch into two parts. Of course, you can mix technology. You don't have to put ports that are close together, you can just give some value to all these, uh, so VLAN value to all these equipment. So in reality, you don't put a color, you will put uh, a VLAN number. So it means that now, when I'm sending a multicast or broadcast frame on the red network, it means that this message will be sent only to red ports. And the green will never see. Okay? So, now, I want to interconnect VLAN red and VLAN green together. What kind of equipment I can use? Why? In fact, it's possible, technically, technologically possible to use a hub, a switch, or a bridge. But if I'm doing that, when I'm sending a broadcast frame on the red network, the broadcast frame will be copied by the bridge, and will be sent to the green one, and then the broadcast will be sent also on the green one. So what does it mean? 
It means that if I put a bridge here, I bridge these two elements, then I will have only one villa, not two separate villa. So I need a router, and if I put a router, then I continue to have two separate villas. So that's why we need that. So now, well, now we have this. So the goal is we have seen that on one equipment, one piece of equipment. Now, if we connect two pieces of equipment, so two bridges together, I send something on the green network, and I want them to be received locally on my green network, but also remotely on another switch on a green network. How can I do that? With traditional Ethernet frame, is it possible to do that? Yeah? Yeah? Yes. We have to do the plug, what does it mean? So in fact, we have to add some information on the frame. If you remember, for example, an Ethernet frame, what do we have inside the Ethernet frame? It's destination address, source address. One thing we don't know very well if it's length or type, it depends. Your payload, your payload, and a check that's yours. Okay? And here the problem is that when I'm sending a red thread on that thing, the other part will not know when we receive it here on that thing. If it has to send it for the red network or on the green network. So we have to tag the frame here to tell on which VLAN we belong. So that's why we have this protocol called, or this frame format called 802.1p or q that defines something we can add to the frame to manage a priority. So here you have the example, on this example, so you have your Ethernet frame, as I draw it on the whiteboard, destination address, source address, type length on two bytes, and CRS. And what I will do, in fact, is to put after source address and before type or length, a tag uh, here. That will be on uh, 32 bit. The first guy, the bits here, is a fixed value, and this value is 8100. So, so here it's a view. If you look another way, you can say that, in fact, my type is 8100 and then I will have a payload, payload and my payload will contain this part so priority uh, CFI and VLAN number and then type length data and then I will have a CRC. So it can be, you can read it both ways. Either I put this information in the middle of my frame, or I have a frame with protocol number, which is 8100, which means VLAN. Now, now that I know the protocol, I can understand the frame format here. VLAN number, type length, and that. So you can read it both. 
But generally, we prefer this way to, to see what we are introducing. So, you have priority. Priority will help your bridge to, if you have some congestion on your bridge, then some packets, will, some uh, frame will go first. So you will have queue management. You have CFI, it was for source routing, so it's not something that is not used. And 12 bits, 12 bits are left, and this bits contain the value of the VLAN, so the VLAN ID. Okay? So, now, when I'm sending thread from A to B, in a normal situation, what happens? A send no more friends. So it means that A doesn't know anything about the app. A send a friend here, and this friend arrives to a port on your switch. Your switch knows about the app. So if it's locally, it will send it only to the port which belongs to the same VLAN. But if you have a trunk, it means a special connection between two switches, then the trunk, on the trunk, you will have this value. That means that it will add what we have seen on the previous slide. So here, 8100, and here, your VLAN ID. And then the rest of the trunk. And then it arrives to the other switch. The other switch will know that you belong to the red VLAN and then you will send it only on the red VLAN and here you know the MAC address on the red VLAN of B and you send it only to B. So this way you isolate the traffic because some, if you want to reach it's not possible to directly at layer 2 reach a device that is connected to the green VLAN. If you want to do that, then you need a routing process somewhere that will enable you to forward the packet from VLAN, from the red VLAN to the green VLAN. Okay? So, that's one evolution. So here, what's the interest of this? Is that I can create a huge infrastructure where I may have some scalability problem and I can restrict the size of my network, logically, to a VLAN. And so this way, I can have more users in my network because they can be on two different networks. Now, it's not, it doesn't work everywhere. For example, suppose that we, we have a network that interconnects some equipment, so some, uh, for example, here some uh, hospital, some school in a city. So, and here we create, we have an Ethernet network that can interconnect these equipment. So, how we can assign VLAN number in POSO? For example, if the police select VLAN 100, can the hospitals or the schools select VLAN 100? If you do that, you, be, you have the same VLAN as the police and you can access the information of the police. So you would have to, we have to avoid the use of the same VLAN for the different companies. So that's a big problem because normally the net, uh, police network is managed differently from the school network or from the hospital network. So you have to tell the police man network manager that you can use VLAN between, let's say, uh, 500 and 600. And the police and the hospital from 600 to 700. If you have to. And maybe you have to check if the police or the hospital respect the rules. That's a problem because at this level we don't have this kind of a way to be done to be managed locally, and when we want to use the same network to interconnect different companies, then there is a problem with the VLAN number sharing. 
So we have a solution that is called Q in Q. So that's a strange name. Do you understand the, the meaning of the name? No? It's because the standard for Milan is Q. So do you know how we how it works I triple E? So I triple E uh, eight oh two has some groups. One is for interconnection, three is the net, eleven is Wi-Fi, etc. etc. And they produce regularly some standard, some standard rules. And every I think it's every four years, something like this. And during each publication, you have some working groups that work to add chapter to that group. And this, uh, this working group are named by a letter. And not only this letter disappear, because when they have finished their work, the work is introduced into the standard. For example, when we talk about 802.11b, Normally, you shouldn't say 11b now, because it was when the standard was defined that it was called b. And after that, it has been introduced in the 802.11 standard book of, let's say, 2000. Here, 2000. So you say clause number, this clause in the standard. But normally, you never remember the clause, but you remember the working group that has done the job. So here, for this tagging, it has been done by p2.1q. And so what we are going to do here is to put 802.2 so two tags together. So here you see, I put this tag here, it's a red tag we saw before, and I add another tag here. So it means that, and let's say someone in the school sends a friend. This frame goes to a switch inside the school. The switch will add this tag. So with this VLAN, which is called CVID, uh, which means Customer VI, uh, VLAN ID. So now we want to send the frame to another school. So what happens? This frame goes to a broadband bridge here. Provider bridge, sorry, a provider bridge here that will take the frame and know that this frame comes from the school. So it will add another VLAN number, and this VLAN number is what we call a service VLAN number, and this service VLAN number is only for the Ethernet network that interconnects the different uh, entities. So this number is never seen by the customer. It is only an internal number from the provider. And then, for example, here we have a spanning tree protocol. It means that the frame is sent using the spanning tree to all the provider bridges here. And these provider bridges know the MAC address and will send it to this uh, equipment. And of course, before sending it, you will remove this orange tag. So then only the purple tag will be here. And so it means that the number here is only a value chosen by the manager of the school size. So it means that here you don't have a risk of collision, because if the police select value 100 and the school manager select also value 100, Inside this network, the provider network, it will be the service VLAN that will differentiate the frame. And when you write to your company, you will see only your customer VLAN. So this way, you don't increase the scalability of the network, but here you separate different customers and they can use the same global infrastructure to communicate. So that's the interest of uh, this kind of thing. Now, there are still some problems. Because suppose that you have, you want, you are make some jokes inside the network. You see that here we have a layer, full layer two network between all the equipment. So imagine that in your school, 
at the time, you create a program on your PC that generates frames with a different MAC address each time you send a frame. And you send it on the network. It means that all the bridges in Itam, we have to remember the MAC address. So that's a problem because the memory of the bridge is limited. So after a certain period of time, you will forget some MAC address. And when the bridge doesn't know MAC address, when he has traffic to that MAC address, he will broadcast it on the network. So it means that you have a decrease in performance. So, in ETAM is not a problem because if you break ETAM network, the network manager will come and fire you from ETAM and the problem is solved. But, and you just put trouble inside ETAM. But if you are doing this interconnection, it means that also you are going to saturate the memory of this network, of this uh, equipment. Because all this equipment will have to memorize your MAC address. So, to avoid that, we have another protocol called MAC in MAC. So what does it mean MAC in MAC? It means that you are going to put your friend here. So you have your, your friend you send with the customer tag that was in purple before, so the one that comes from the company. And you will put it at the provider uh, bridge here. You will put it in another frame. And here, you will have different addresses. The MAC address you will have here as the MAC address of the provider bridge, not the MAC address of the equipment in your customer. Your customer. So what's the advantage of this? is that equipment in the middle here will not have to remember all the MAC addresses of all the equipment on all the customer side, but we just have to remember the MAC address of your provider by both bridge. That means that here is two addresses compared to a large number of addresses you will have in the company. So, of course, when you send a friend here, so I send a friend A to B, it's, of course, it's easy to, when I do the encapsulation, to put my MAC address, but I don't know where is B. So I don't know the MAC address of this provider bridge. So how can we do, how we can solve this problem? is to use first a broadcast message or a multicast message. So I will send a multicast on my network, the frame from A to B to from, so here you have A to B and this is the original frame, and it is encapsulated into the other frame with here you have the MAC address of the source and a broadcast address of the destination. Since we are in a spanning tree here, we will reach B. And this and all the bridges here will learn the mapping. When I want to reach A, I have to use MAC address of this provider. And this way, on this one, provider bridge, backward bridge was zero, will have this map. So when I the answer came, B, B to A, I have the mapping here. And then I'm able to send directly, using the static tree, the frame towards the destination. Okay? So, that's if you are a provider, so you manage the green network, it's better for you. Because, as I said, you just memorize here, MAC address of your provider bridges. You don't have to know all the complexity of the world. If, of course, these provider bridges here will have to know the mapping between MAC addresses that are outside of the world and MAC addresses that 
are known as assigned to provide your data. So this one will have bigger table. But the one in the core network will have smaller table. And here it is important because, for example, if you have a lot of customers, you can put a lot of provider backbone bridges. And then you link it. Here you don't have a problem of performance. Here, in the middle of the network, you will have high throughput high, high throughput needs. And here you have to you have to be fast. And the less stable you have, the faster you will be. So here you increase the performance inside your network. You also uh, if someone tries to fool you and generate, generate back addresses, then of course you can saturate for customer, uh, the school customer, is its table. So if you saturate the table here, you will have, the school will have problems. But the other, uh, the other uh, entities will not have this problem. So it means that if you have someone that tries to, to fool you, it will be only, the problem will be only for you, not for the rest of the users. And the other thing that is important, and it's linked to what I say with spanning tree, here I get an example in spanning tree, of course you can put here graphic spanning tree, but if you have a failure in the, in the network, it may take, let's say, 10 seconds to recover, which is good for computer traffic, but if you are sending also voice over IP or things like this inside the network, then four seconds is too long. That's why we have here, we will have over routing protocol or bridging protocol that will be defined to switch rapidly from one link to another. So, this is just an introduction about uh, this kind of technologies. What is important to you have to remember for the rest of the class is this kind of architecture where we isolate things in the core network and we have devices that make the link between the core network and outside network. When we will see MPLS, we will have the same vision. In MPLS, we have equipment that we call PE provider edge that interconnect your network to another network and the goal is to simplify the core network and to have simple routers in the middle that can process the packet very quickly. So we will have almost the same architecture when we will study layer 3 network. And uh, during a practical in, uh, in REN, we will see what we call L2 VPN and how we can use and PLS and uh, PGP to make L2 links and we can link this to this kind of architecture. Okay, so that's why the, that was the first part of the class based on layer 2. It's important to, to see that because in REN you will have some practical on VLAN the first particle will be uh, to play with VLAN on the, on the network, and then we will have, as I say, some exercise on L2 VPN. So we will see this, this kind of technology, that's why uh, I spent some time to, to describe it. But now, let's forget about layer 2, and we are going to, to look at layer 3. And more precisely, at the IP family in IPv4 and IPv6. So Nicola already made an introduction about IP, so I will not go the same way, I will not focus on the packet format, but I will focus more in my class on addressing technology. And we'll see that if you look at IP, the packet format can be seen as ugly. It doesn't matter. What is important is how you manage IP. And we are going to, to see uh, this kind of So first, for those who forget a little bit about the OSI model, I don't know if you have already seen this uh, kind of figure. No? So this is the OSI model, the 
C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 layers. So that's uh, correct. Don't read what is inside because it's not uh, really a website protocol description. But we have these uh, this kind of things. But you see that the IP layer is small, very small. So when you talk about IP to over uh, standardization institute, for example, ITU, ITU call IP important protocol. So protocol that does nothing. And they say that's a bad thing because we at ITU are developing protocol that are very, very efficient and does a lot of it. But it's not in the IP philosophy. The IP philosophy is to be the simplest protocol as possible for several reasons. The first one is that if you are simple, it's quite easy to port application on IP because the interface is very small. So when you write a program, you have a very few uh, system calls that you can use to communicate with IP. So, it's quite easy to put something here. And then, since IP is very simple, it's quite easy to port IP on layer 2. For example, porting IPv4 on Ethernet is very, very simple. You have seen that, you see that you need IRP protocol to make the mapping between uh, layer 3 addresses and layer 2 addresses. But that's almost what you have to do, and the rest is very, very simple. It's not always the case. When you will go, if you go to REN, we took a lot this year about wireless and some network. And the mapping between IPv6 and 802.80, uh, 802.15.4 is not so simple. So 802.15.4 is a protocol. I don't know if you know about DP. Have you heard about DP? No? So Zigbee is a, a protocol that you can use, for example, to, to switch up the light in your home, or to send commands, or to, to get some information that you want to open your uh, garage door. So you can use a Zigbee protocol to send this kind of message. So what is important, uh, if you have an alarm system in your home, they can use this kind of protocol. So what is important in this kind of protocol is the energy management. It means that you put two batteries on a device, and this device must last for at least one or two years. And so energy is something very, very important. If you have Ethernet, Ethernet doesn't care about energy, because you are on a computer, this computer is connected to the electricity power, and so you don't have the, this kind of when you have something on batteries, it's different. And with Zigbee, so Zigbee is a kind of layer 3 layer. Uh, so you have Zigbee here, but under, you have a protocol that is 802, I'll sorry. 802.15.4. And this protocol is particular network, particular protocol because the frame size is only 127 bytes. So it's very, very small frames. And so when you want to port IPv6 and 802.15.4, it's very complex and you need an adaptation layer called 605. So here it's not so trivial to put IP on a layer 2. But it's possible. It has been done, it has been just analyzed by the IP. So every time you have a new layer 2, then you can put IP on it. So it means that IP is just a small link between application and layer 2. So when I'm developing an application here, I don't care about layer 2. It's an interface between upper layer and lower layer. The other thing, so, the other thing is that 
I since IP is very simple. When you receive a packet, you can forward it very easily. Because you don't process a lot of things, you just look at the destination address and you find the existing interface. So you don't spend a lot of time on the packet. And this is the most important thing that has been done by the ATF, is to make the forwarding very efficient. And if you look at IPv4 header, uh, so Nicola gave you all the details about IPv4 header, I don't go into details, but at the end, you have a destination address, and this destination address has a lot of properties. First one, it's always at the same place. So when I'm a router, I receive a packet, I know that the destination address is always here. The size is fixed. So I know that this address will end here. And the low, we have an element in memory on 32 bit. It means that here, a processor that receives a packet with just one read can get all the address of that process. So it means that the IP address packet was designed to forward very quickly that address. So it's written in the law. So here, the RFC that described IP before in September 1981 says that the address are fixed length of four. Okay, so that's written in the row. And at that time, in 1980, there was about 100 computers on the internet. So, people that introduced the, the protocol say that we have 100 computers, and with 32 bytes, we can number about 4 billion equipments. Of the so what does it mean? It means that compared to 100 equipment we have, it's not a problem. We, we have enough room to put all the devices. Of course, now we are not in the same position. Because the internet was designed at the beginning to be an experimental network to prove that data gram was better than connection oriented networks to, to try things, but nobody expected to have IP as IPv4 as the universal protocol we know right now. And so the problem is that now we are there is not enough addresses. We are reaching the limit of the 42 billion. Address on the net, oh, sorry, the four billion address in the net. So that's a problem because we cannot extend the size of the address because it's written in the law that addresses are four by one. We cannot change little by little this size because IP is implemented everywhere. So in your laptop, in the routers. Everywhere on Earth, every equipment that, run, that are connected to the Internet has a stack with IPv4. And they obey to that law. So, it's impossible to adapt IPv4 to a large number of, or larger number of equipment. So that's why we have to develop a new protocol, this protocol is called IPv6, but we have larger and we will see in more details how it has been done. So if we look at the address or the internet, as I said in uh, just a few minutes ago, at the beginning, in uh, 1983, when VIP was introduced in the network, there was about 100 equipment in the net. So it was not really a problem. So University start choosing IP and start to interconnect with IP, using IP. And little by IP little, you have content that arrives on the network. 
And so the network was more and more useful because you can talk with more and more people and you get more and more, and more information on that network. But at, the, at this time, there was other competitor from IP, IP is one. You have, for example, Novel, that developed a, a protocol called IPX. This protocol has different kinds of address, and a layer two address on Novel was cut into two parts. You have two bytes, that give a network number and six bytes that contains your MAC address. And this way you can connect to the network. And with Novel, so you put your PC on the network and with a Novel network, you are able to talk with a printer to print documents. You are able to print, to talk with a disk server to get information, and for example, you were able also to, to talk uh, to an equipment to get your mail. But you can go outside of your network. So one big reason is that the address, you have no guarantee that the address was unique. Here, every network administrator put one, two, three, four in their network value. And so it was impossible to interconnect before. I think took another choice and developed some scheme to allocate unique address to every equipment connected on the network. It means that since every equipment has a unique address, they were able to talk to to each other. And what, that was a big difference, for example, with IPX. IPX worked well inside your company. You have a kind of plug and play. You put your computer on the network, and he learns about the link and the network address, and then add his MAC address and create his network address. So it was quite easy. You have plug and play extra. IP didn't have that, but had global connectivity. And in 1982, so the network starts to grow. University use that, use it. And in 1992, there was two events that makes IP the unique protocol. The first one is that the US now say it will not be a, just a science activity, but the internet will become a commercial activity. So everybody can connect to the network and can pay, of course to uh, make the network better. And the other thing is that you have a, a program called Mosaic that around. Do you know about Mosaic? No? You never heard of that? It was the ancestor of Netscape, or Internet Explorer, or all these things. Uh, and there was a big difference between Mosaic and what we have before. When you know the web, everybody can use the web. Because when it's written in blue and it's on the line, you can click on it and get the information. So everybody can understand that. Before, when you wanted an information, you'd have to do a FTP, connect to the site, make an anonymous login, and then type uh, get the file you want, etc. So it was quite complex, you have to do Linux command, you have to know uh, FTP command, etc., etc. So only computer scientists were able to use that. With Mosaic, everybody can use the internet. But you cannot use IPX. Because Mosaic says that I have my web browser here, and I want to connect to a server that is located somewhere in the network. So here, IPX is not possible. Because IPX, I can only communicate with device inside my company. So it means that network manager has to run IPv4 
and IPX together to get with IPX access to resources inside the company and with IPv4 to allow web browsing on other side. But there is a common rule about network managers is that they are very lazy and they don't want to run two protocols together on the network. So what they decide to do is to suppress IPX and only to use IPv4. And that's why people say that IPv4 was a, uh, on the web was a killer application for IPv4 because the web killed all the other layer three protocols that exist at that time. And only IPv4 survived and was widely used. The problem is that when you lose, when you are using IPX, you have auto configuration. You can configure your network at layer 3. You can discover services like printer, mail server, uh, file server, etc., etc., totally automatically. With IPv4, it was not possible. You have to configure manually your, your network address. You don't discover your resources, etc. But the market decides and says that global connectivity was much better than auto configuration inside your network. And that's why IPv4 became more and more popular. And at that time, the addressing scheme was not very, very uh, well done because the goal was not to manage some uh, lack of addresses, but it was a kind of bootstrap phase. It means that if you want to go to the internet, it was very easy to go to the internet. So you just request a prefix, and you got that prefix. But at that time, there was only three kinds of prefix, class A, B, and C. I don't know if I have a... So, class, class A means that an authority gave you 7 bytes, one uh, value, or 7 bits, to number your network. So it starts with a 0 here, and you have 7 bits, and then 24 bits, where you can do what you want to number your network. If you have a class B, Start with one zero, then you have 14 bits to number a network. So we impose you 14 bits, and you have six, 16 bits to number your equipment into your network. And class C, that start with one one zero, you have 21 bits that are allocated to you to design your company network, and it remains only eight bits to number your equipment, your piece of equipment, on the net. So, what will you sell it? In the early 90s, when you wanted to be connected to the internet, you cannot get the class A. Class A was impossible because you had only, there was only 127 networks, and they were given to big companies, US companies, or big US universities. You will not ask for a class C because class C is not very efficient. You have only 250, about 250 addresses on the network. So for example, if you want to connect 2,000 equipment, piece of equipment in your network, then you need eight class C. So normally, if you have 2,000 piece of equipment, you will receive a class B. A class B allow you to have 65,000 computer equipment in your network. You will use only 2,000, so you are going to use 63,000 addresses on the network. But it was easy to manage. And that's what people wanted at the beginning. And so a lot of people got 
class B address. But the problem is that in uh, 1993, people see that there was no C libraries, only 16,000 uh, class B addresses. So if you look worldwide and everybody wants to connect to internet, this is not a large number. And so the class B began to be exhausted and nobody can use it anymore. So people start using class C. But if you have a company that runs 2,000 pieces of equipment, then you have to use A plus, A plus C, A plus C, and put its value on routers. And here's the problem that routers fail because they don't have enough memory to memorize all this information. So that's why people say in 1993 that internet was a very good idea, but it will disappear soon because internet is not scalable. Not scalable because the more user you are, the more problem you have. You don't have enough addresses if you use plus B, or if you use plus C, you break the network. And Bob Melkart made a prediction that in year 2000, we will never help, we will have forget about internet. Of course, he lost his prediction, uh, and during a conference, he ate the paper he wrote about that and that's because he was wrong. But in fact, he was not so wrong because the way we manage the internet has totally changed in 1993. So, currently we are talking about IPv6 and say that IPv6 uh, is a real nightmare because we have to change from one protocol to another and these two protocols are incompatible. But people who were present on the internet in 1993 had a higher nightmare to move from what we call class full addresses to classless addresses. So it was very complex to move networks from one way to manage address to another one. But at that time, internet was not everywhere. So it was not so obvious or visible than we have now with IP for IPv6. Because now everybody is using IP, and so you really have to, to change that. So, in 1993, three things has been done to change the way the internet will be. One we are going to see in the future, and as I say, is to suppress the class address to something that is called classless addressing. Another one is to start developing a new protocol, and this new protocol is nowadays IPv6. And the last thing is to reframe the use of addresses. So one way to avoid to use too much addresses is to use private addresses. So what is private addresses? Is address that you are sure that nobody else will use officially. For example, you have Prefix, so I will give, do you understand this notation? 10 slash 8? No? So because I'm very lazy, so normally I should have write 10.000 slash 8. Or, if you don't know about this notation, 265.0.0.0 Okay? So here is what we call a net mask and here is what we call a prefix name. So, a net mask you see if I write 255 in binary I will have 1111111111 Okay? And then after a lot of zeros if I count the number of bits equal to 1, and I have 8 bits equal to 1. So 
So here I can write slash a. It means that the eight, the eight first bit, defined by prefix. So a common part to all my equipment, and the rest is the address. If it's equal to zero, it means that it's the network where I put my equipment. So now, since I'm very lazy, I don't want. I know that the address, my BB4 address, is on 32 bits. So I don't have to write the bits equal to zero. So I just write 10 slash 3. Okay? Like, well, you have 192, 168 slash 16, which is another uh, address in the class C part, but here it means that you have 16 bits for the two first bytes that are common. On the rest, you can put any number you want. And you have another address in class B that have been allocated for private usage. What does it mean? It means that you can use it inside your company network, but you cannot live outside with this address. So the, main, the first idea was I have a printer here. So normally my printer is only used by people inside my company. So I will give a private address to my printer. And I have a computer here. This computer may have a private address or a global address to go outside to serve the web. But when he wants to reach a printer, he will go using a private address. So, in the first vision, we can say that only equipment that needs to go outside will have a public address, and the other one we can have a private address. So that's the main idea, but in fact it's not so easy, and the need for global address is still high because all your laptop, all your equipment in your network will need this kind of addresses. If you found only a printer, on this server, it's very, very few equipment. But means that it doesn't limit the need for IP. IP. So the next step was to introduce a device called NAT. NAT means Network Address Translation. And what does it mean? It means that here, I will give private address to all the equipment. And only if I want to live outside, the NAT box will change the private address to a public address. So the main difference here is that only active flows will need a public address. If my computer is on the network but doesn't send flow outside, I will not, will not waste a public address. So this is one, the first vision. And then we have another vision that is called NatPT for, for port translation, which means that here I can have only one public address and I can use port number to map the flows. So it means that all the flows from my company will appear as only coming from one element if I look from all. So, we are going to see that in more detail because it's uh, quite funny to, to see uh, all the mess that has been introduced by, uh, by NAT, but we have also some advantage. So, everything is not right. So, how does it work? So here we have an example. I have a computer in my company, 10.0.0.1. This computer it has a private address, but it doesn't know. For this computer, it's an address like the other. But we know that 10-8 is a private prefix. So suppose that this device wants to reach a server which has a global address. 128, 123. 
So, it's a not like that. Say, my name is 10.0.0.1. I am sending to that server. And I use a layer 4, the port number. And I want to reach HTTP service. So, port 80. So, what will be do the NAT? The NAT will change this address, this source address, because this is a private address, and the private address cannot leave the network. So instead, I will put the public address allocated to my NAT, 192, 1.1.1. So, I will do that, and I may change also the source port here, and put another value, and maintain in my NAT memory a mapping table that says that on port 1890 it's in fact locally, internally 10.0.0.1 on port number 1234. So why we have to do this change? It's because suppose that I have another computer here 10.0.0.2 that want to reach the same server. So you are in your home, you have two computers, but wants to go to the Google server. That's a common thing. So they will use a different private address, they will use the same server address for Google, they will use a port number, but there is absolutely no guarantee that the port number will be selected as, if a, the other computer will select a different value. Because port numbers are locally selected by the computer. So maybe they can select the same value. And then they will go to Google web server, so they will use port 80. So internally, the only difference will come from the source address. But externally, I have only one public address. So I will put here the same public address. And here, if I select the same port number, I will use the same port number, then there is ambiguity for, to define both connections. So the NAT will have to rewrite this value, and this value will be used without defining the code. So if I have another computer here, I have another value, and here I will put 10.0.0.2 and private port number. So, I have this. Then when the packet comes back, of course this server doesn't know about uh, the NAT, so answer, and so he answer to equipment or device 192.1.1.1. So the packet reaches the NAT, and the NAT look at the destination port number 7890. And so, he look in his memory and find the mapping here and can send back the information to 10.0.0.1. So if you look from the server part, it was a connection between a public address and himself. And if I look internally, it was a connection between the private address and the server. So it's totally transparent at this level outside or inside the network. Okay? So, what is important to notice here is that we will now identify a flow by its port number, no more by its address. So, first consequence, here, you don't know your public name. So I don't know if people you realize you have seen a spam server. Stun? S T U N. The voice over IP. So that's a big problem because when I am uh, using voice over IP here, I can send a SIP message telling this is my address. When you want to call me, use that address. But of course, they, this is a private address. I don't know. Because it's an, for me, it's an address I open. 
but the receiver, the gateway, which may be outside, why the gateway will try to reach me, it will not be possible because the gateway will have only a private address and will not be able to send it to me, to send the packet to me. So that's the problem, you don't know your public identity. So that's why you have a stun server for voice over IP. So we are going to you have here a stun server which is outside of your private network, so your stun server has a public address. And here you have your SIP agent that will wants to communicate with a registrar, a proxy, a SIP proxy. So how will he do first? He will send a message to the stun server. So here he has his public address. And private address, sorry, and the stun server will answer giving its public address. So this way, this equipment knows about its public address. Public address. And then, when you will do a registrar, then you will give here its public address. And so the packet, incoming packet, will go to the NAT. And then to the NAT, maybe if we are lucky, this packet will be able to cross the NAT. Okay, but here you have to, to know your address from outside. So you have to put this, this kind of things. Other things that are more or less good is that you, you have a security feeling when you put that. Because if I have a host here, 10.0.0.2, that has never talked outside, from outside, then this host cannot be reached from outside. Because to be reached from outside, you need to be, to have a context. And your address has to be, your private address has to be in the context. So, that's good, I put my computer, I have no, if I don't talk outside, then I am not suitable from outside. So that's a kind of protection. So that's true and false. For example, you have some virus that may send packets, and this way they create some context here, and then your computer will be reached. So it's not really a secure, you cannot guarantee security. But since the NAT, the NAT is complex, you, when you want to attack a site, you have to do it manually. You cannot run script for that, because all NAT behavior are different. So normally, it protects you from the normal attacks. If you have a clever attack, then your NAT can be false. But for normal usage, it's a kind of security. So if you have your Windows 7 on your uh, home, then you are protected because the NAT will block the attack and you can upload the security patch before you get attacked. If uh, we saw that, for example, in some ATF conference where we had public addresses, IP4 public address, and we were attack under attack before we had the time to install the patch. So here it gave you time to manage a little bit more your network, so you have some security, but it's not strong security. And the last point is that, and maybe that's a security, that's a good point for some people, is that you don't have good standardization of that. There was, until now, no RFC describing what is an app. Which means that you have different implementation of that and they behave totally different. So it means that it makes attacks more difficult, but it makes also NAT traversal more, more difficult. If you want to write a, an application like Skype, Skype is the best example of application that cross NAT in any case, and they have to check Skype against every kind of box or router you can have. 
because each router can have a different behavior. And of course, you don't know when you run an application what kind of NAT you have. And if I ask, I think you, if you have ADSL at your home, you have a NAT box in your ADSL bar, a router. If I ask you what kind of NAT you are, you have, you cannot answer. Because you don't know the implementation. So you don't know the behavior of your NAT. So that's a, that's a problem. So, and we have different kinds of NAT. So first category is what you can call a public NAT. So what is a public NAT is, for example, here, I have this guy, which has a public address 2999, but wants to attack, well, that sends a packet to 192.1.1.1. .1 using port number 123 and destination port number 7890. And back here, what I have in my context, it says that something that used port 7890 must be translated in 10.0.0.1 and port 1234. So it means that here, the packet will reach the equipment. Because the context here has only the port number. So that's normally the host will discard the packet because the mapping here doesn't take it. But if you can forge a packet that makes the network stack uh, collapse, then you can break this computer. So that's why, but sometimes it's very useful. For example, if I have a SIP server, I may ask all people that want to call me to send invite to that port number, and then that port number will go to my SIP server. So it can be done automatically. In that case, my SIP server sends a registrar message here and create he has a public port number, and this public port number will be sent to proxies. Or manually, I say when I receive something, for example, on port 5060, then I send it to locally, this equipment on port 5060. And this way, I can receive SIP invites coming from outside. So that's good because I don't have to know which equipment will send me an impact. So that's something very uh, useful to run SIP. Because SIP, I'm waiting, expecting incoming calls. And using this kind of connect NAT, it's possible to have incoming calls. But it's not so secure. So the large majority of NAT has restricted NAT. And what is a restricted NAT? It means that I do a mapping not only with the port number, but also with the source address. So this way, if this guy wants to attack me, this guy will be blocked because his source address is not, is not correct. So that's a problem because if I want to receive an invite from outside, it will not be possible. That's why. If you look at SIP, you have, remember, we have this stun server. So there is a technique called ICE in voice over IP. When, when you send, you do a registrar, you give your private address, you give your public address, <coughs> and then you give your stun server address. What does it mean? It means that a guy that is inside your company will be able to use a private address to join you. A guy that is outside your company, and if your NAT is conic, can use your public address to join you. But if your NAT is restricted, then this will be blocked. So in that case, you will send your call to the stun server 
And since when you have done this uh, protocol, you have opened a hole between the stamp server and you, then the stamp server will proxy the traffic to you. And this way, you will be able to receive incoming calls. But this means that you need something outside of the company or outside of your private network. And the problem is, for example, if you open it to everybody, it means that everybody will use that to proxy the traffic and to other that. So normally, you have to define a security check before register. So you, you need to log on the stone server to allow this kind of thing. But then you see that it's very complex because you have to move to define your identities, password linked to identities, etc. etc. And put the equipment here outside of your network. So that's a big problem because it increased the complexity of the network. So we are going to see, so this is this pass for C. We have the, almost the same thing with Skype, but Skype is a more uh, obscure, like, obscure protocol. We don't know really how it works because it's not a standard, it's defined by the company, Skype. And a lot of things are cipher inside, so it's very difficult to know how the protocol works. But here are the Networks. Suppose here that our network, so you are, you have a name, and you get an IP uh, address. So what you will do is to contact some super nodes and give register by giving your name and your IP address, and this information will go to different super nodes. When someone want to join you, he will query this super node and he will get the answer. So we'll get your IP address and we'll be able to contact you directly. So that's the case here when you are running Skype on with equipment that have global addresses. Now if you put a NAT, it doesn't work so well. Because here, when I will ask the question, where is Bart Simpson? I will get, I will receive the private address. Well, because here, it was in the payload, and the NAT doesn't change the payload. <coughs> so how to deal with that is in fact to look, not in the payload, but to look at the IPv4 header. And in the IPv4 header, I have the public address. So I can send here I can give the public address, and this way, this guy will be able to contact my NAT. If I have a connect NAT, no problem, I will be joined. If I have a restricted NAT, then I will send the information to a proxy. I talk already with the proxy, and this proxy will send me the information. So what does it mean? It means that when you are running your computer on a public address, you can be a super node. So if you are running Skype, you are doing the internet network, you have a public address, and so you can do, be used to register your uh, someone addresses on your Skype, Skype program. But also the traffic can go through your network. So ETAM manager will see a lot of traffic running on the network because you are proxying the traffic. So that's a problem and that's why, if possible, because it's quite difficult to block Skype, but network manager will block Skype to avoid to have this extra traffic on the network. It, they can give you as some server. But normally Skype is more a peer-to-peer -peer protocol, it means that Everybody can have this functionality. So if you are outside a network, a private, a private network, or a public network, you are a kind of stone server for Skype. And you are a proxy server. So, this, you see there is some similarity between these, these two applications. Okay, so, that's uh, a way 
You see that now? What can I do with an IP address? If I have a NAT, I have one public address here. How many flows can be leaving my network? How many flows? So, here, the port number is on 16 bits, so I can add up to 65,565 uh, 65, flows, okay, with only one address. Now, if I have a restricted NAT, I can have this value by servers. So if you have people in your company that goes to Google, you can have up to 65,000. If you have other people in your company that goes to Bing, then you can have also 65,000 using one IP address. Okay? So it means that it's a huge number of flows, active flows, that you can manage very much. So I think that it reduces really the need for IPv4 address. And that was the goal of NAT, because you see, in 1993, the problem was detected, but it takes time to create a new version of an IP protocol. At least it takes 15 years uh, to have IPv6. So it means that uh, it gives, it reduces the need for IPv4 addresses. So this way, we have more time. So we are going to, to look now at the other measure that has been taken. It is the CIDR part. It means that here, instead of using flat addressing like we have before 1993, we are going to use a hierarchical address. What does it mean for that address? It means that when you were so when you were at ITAM, you request for an IP address or IP prefix, and you got something, I don't remember it's 148 or something. But if you look for example, 448206 uh, will be in Japan. Seven will be in the US. So it means that, I don't know, we have, can have a look. But it means that it's a flat addressing. It means that we don't know geographically where you are. It's just because the person who get 206 is because this person arrived after, just after it happened. So the, the router doesn't know the history and has to memorize 205 to say, okay, I have to send it to Italy, and 206, I have to send it to Japan. So it means that it needs a lot of memory inside the router to do that. So to avoid this, the CIDR plan, so CIDR means no class, will be managed differently. In fact, if you look at the address, we are going to see the first 8 bits here. So I notice, notice it alpha slash 8. And this will be given to some regional registries. These regional registries will give this address to the provider for example, Telmex will get a prefix. And then Telmex will give this prefix to its customer. And so the customer will have a kind of hierarchical address because if you read it, Alpha will give you the, uh, the, uh, the region you are, 15 will give you the provider, and 45 will notify the customer inside this provider. So you have something here. Of course, the, the 
the limits are not so so easy because you can have slash uh, uh, since slash 16 you can have a slash 15 or slash 22 so it can be everywhere it's been you have to look at the binary value to know but here I use only the hexadecimal representation so this way you, you have this kind of value. so what are these regions so but this this is administrative way to allocate addresses. In fact, it's because since more and more people wanted addresses, that the poor secretary that allocate one by one the address was overloaded by the so That's why administratively they created a tree. So when a customer wants something, he asks to the provider. When the provider doesn't have any resources, he asks to his original registry. And when the original registry doesn't have enough resources, he asks to be IM. So this way you have something that is more administratively manageable. But technically, it doesn't work that way. Technically, you have just provider. And this provider interconnects themselves to create a graph of provider. That's what you call the internet or internet work. So at some place, you have some provider that knows all the routes, all the prefixes inside the internet network. And this provider exchanges information using a routing protocol called BGP. So in a very simple approach of BGP, because at the end of this week, we'll look in more detail at BGP. But here, this provider tells to the other, here's the prefix I'm using and the other will send this prefix. So, if we... So this, uh, this is a good addressing plan because, you see, for example, this provider doesn't give the list of its customer. What the provider announces outside is just an aggregation of all the prefixes of its customer, so a shorter prefix. So here, if I have 250 uh, customer, I just send one entry. And the size of the prefix is smaller. The smaller the size is, the more generic is the prefix. And so, but the problem is, for example, when I want to change, so I was uh, using Telmex to, co to connect my company, but Telmex is very expensive. Just mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. And so I want to move to a cheaper provider. If I do that, I cannot use the term express. Because it means that the other provider will have to announce this term express. So what does it mean? It means that here this provider will announce its own prefix alpha.32 slash 16 and alpha 15.220-24 Okay? So we have to announce these two rules. Now, we have a rule in the internet that is called longest prefix match, which is very important when we run a cider, when we run cider on it. Here, suppose that we have, I will give you it on a simple example. I have two routers. I will call them alpha.1 and alpha.2. And here, I have three prefixes that are connected to that router. 10.0.0.1.0 slash 24. 10.0.1 slash 24. 10, uh, the 0 dot 0 dot 2 slash 24. Okay? So, how can I represent this information into the routing table? One solution is to type 10 dot 0 dot 0 dot 0 slash 24. I will send it to alpha dot 1. 10.0.0.1 slash 24 I will send it to alpha.2 10.0.0.1 slash 
10.0.0.2.24, I will send it to alpha.0. Okay? Is there a more compact way to represent the information? Sixteen, yes, but it's a little bit too small. So here, because if you do sixteen, for example, it means that eight, one hundred, uh, one hundred, etc., etc., are here. Here, we'd like to have just the right value. I'm going to write this in binary. So zero is zero, 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 zero. One is zero, 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 zero. 0, 0, 0, 1. 2 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Okay? So what does it mean? It means that these 6 bits here are fixed, doesn't change, but these 2 bits here are changing. So instead of writing this 3 value, I can write in my routing table 10.0.0 slash 22 goes to alpha dot 1. Okay? So this way, I have a more compact notation of my prefix. So here, I say 10.0.0 slash 22. Or if I'm very easy, I will ten, write 10 slash 22. will go to alpha dot 1. But the problem is that now I'm connecting 10.0.0.3 0 .0 here. So what do I do? So here I put 10.0.0.3, zero zero, uh, sorry, 10.0.0.3. Zero oh, so I will put 10.0.3 zero slash 24 goes to alpha dot, alpha dot 2. Okay? So now I'm sending a packet to 10.0.3.1. This packet arrives to my router, and I check in my routing table. So this entry is correct, because the 22 first bits are the same. This entry is correct because the, the first 24 bits of this nation are correct. So here we apply the longest prefix match. It means that I will select this entry because I have more bits in common. In common. Now if I have two the 10.0.2.1 so 10.0.0.22 is correct, but this one is not correct. So I will use the longest prefix match, and so I will send it to that one. So what does it mean? It means that I can, I have to look at all the possible entries in my routing table to find the longest prefix match. And I can write things more complex. For example, if I want to put here a host 10.0.3.3 .3. Then I can put in my routing table 10.0.0 10 I send it to alpha.1 So in that case, this one will match This one will match, this one will match This one is the longest prefix match So I will send it to alpha.1 And on the opposite, if I write 0 slash 0 so it means that here is what we call the default root. And here, if I send it to 11.0 something, nothing match here. The only thing that match is the entry where I have no bit in common. So maybe I will send it to my gateway. So with this cider representation, I can add good roots for uh, aggregation of prefixes, I can send it to a specific prefix in a specific host, or I can define also the default host. Okay, so you see that there is something very complex, but if we come back to, to that example, what does it mean? It means that when 
I move from one part to another, then I will have to announce a prefix, and this prefix will go to that point. So I propose you to, to have a break right now, and we will see at top. So just to conclude, it means that if you change, here yeah, remember the initial prefix for them, is that I want to change my customer, my provider, so here I cannot keep my 10 next prefix. And I will have to remember all my sites. So that's a big problem if you have a very big site, because you have to reconfigure all your equipment.